Good afternoon, listeners. It's Abel Sampson from Car Design News. Um, extremely happy to welcome you to this year's launch of the Car Design News Review Book 7, something we had planned to do in London in May at the RCA. Um, unfortunately, with, with the circumstances we've had with uh, COVID-19, we're having to do it virtually, um, but still great to be involved in such an important uh, product within the portfolio of uh, CDNs offering to the industry. Um, we've got some interesting things happening uh, during the next 45 minutes to an hour. Um, but before we get going, I just want to remind you guys um, that if you are streaming anything, um, just to make sure that you don't lose anything, we've got some video, we've got some, um, um, some really great images to show you. Just make sure that you're not streaming anything. If you lose connectivity, don't panic. Just uh, click the button to log back on and you'll instantaneously get back online. If you do miss anything, this is uh, recorded and put on the CDN YouTube channel so you can watch it back. Um, hopefully I won't make any mistakes, so I won't get on any of those amazing television programs. But you'll be able to watch it and share it with your colleagues. We tend to get anywhere between the five and 6,000 views post uh, one of our live streams. So be one of those people if you want to watch it on demand. Um, my next thing to do is, is to really do the official launch um, of the book. And to, to really do that, you know, we felt at Car Design News, we need to bring in our uh, editor, Max, Maxine Morland. She um, is the person who has the, the tireless job to work with um, our printers, um, our judges, our experts. So if I can uh, bring in Max into the live stream. Um, again, she's in lockdown, so she's in another part of the, the country. Hi, Max. How are you? I'm very well, Abel. How are you? Yeah, you're wearing my favourite jumper today again, so it's nice to see you in such bright colours on a rainy day. I'm bringing the sunshine. <laughs> yeah. So before we get going, um, this is the official launch, as I mentioned. Um, and I thought it would be good, really, just to, for Max, can you give us an overview of uh, this year's uh, car design uh, review? Yeah, of course. So, as Abel just outlined this year, car design review faced the same challenges that everyone's faced. We had material supply problems, we had home working challenges, um, achieving social distancing whilst continuing to work and produce products it's not just us who've um, been facing these difficulties, the industry's been facing them as well. But I am delighted to say that the Car Design News team and more importantly, all of our interview subjects have adapted beautifully and we're really pleased with the results. This year's book has a special lightweight composite material called Mitesio as its front cover. Now we chose this material because, well, for a variety of reasons, but mainly because it epitomizes a trend that we've identified in the use of composites for light weighting, but also for the variety of forms that can be achieved with it. Now it's not a book binding material. Um, you may have seen this concept, this material in concept cars, and also in Covestro's interior concept, which was shown at the K Fair last year. We've spent probably the last 10 months uh, testing and prototyping it to enable us to have the material bound in and printed as our front cover. And the design team at Covestro and I have really enjoyed the process, even if it has occasionally thrown a few curveballs at us. Um, it sounds slightly absurd that it would take 10 months, um, but we're adapting a material that is not a book binding material into a book. So prototyping and, and testing has become really critical. Inside this year's book, we've covered autonomous trends in more detail uh, than we ever have before, reflecting, we think, the increase in the industry, alongside exterior and interior trends, stunning infographics, and original analysis. Our designers section profiles the judges for this year's awards. We've also picked the best student work of 2019, and we have a long form article about the career of our Lifetime Achievement Award winner. Finally, we review all the cars in the shortlist for concept and production car of the year. This book can be purchased <laughs> on the Car Design News website for a July delivery. 
Um, I'm now going to hand back to Abel, um, our publisher, because Abel's going to take us through a video of the production cards or the judges. Thanks, Max. Um, you know, this was a, an interesting year for everyone, but especially for Car Design News team um, and all the all the suppliers we've worked with. So again, I want to say thank you to the team at Car Design News, Max's team, our design team, our printers, and all the judges as well. But you know, what we do strive for in Car Design News is to do is to do something that is special for the industry. We truly believe that um, our relationships with the industry is key to how we cover design. You know, having writers that are actually from, from a design background, we have an independence that we really do think is important to us. So when we do want to do a, a, a book or an awards, it is in our interest to actually bring in the experts. You know, we're great at covering cars, but we don't actually build cars at Car Design News. So the best way of judging the best car of the year or the best concept production or the best student of the year is to actually bring in the experts. I'm just showing you on this screen, these are the partners that we worked with this year, our judges, the best of the best, who are able to judge the cars that are in this year's book. Now, one of the criteria, which is extremely important to mention, is they cannot vote for their own car but they can actually appreciate great design from their industry colleagues um, and the car brands. So I thank them all for their honesty in judging, thank their support for being involved in the book. Um, and now I have the, the best task of hitting the button um, to actually run through the top 10 in production. So Max, if I can ask you to turn off your camera. We're going to share with you the top 10. Okay. If you just. All right, we've got a. Um, a slight technical problem here with the top 10. So if you just bear with me a second, Max, if I can just bring you back into the conversation. Hi. Um, well, Max, if, um, if we can go through some of the um, key highlights of the, well, I'm just gonna go through the process of just making sure we've got the audio correct. So if you can just go through um, uh, the book in a bit more detail. Um, yeah, cool. So one of the reasons this year that we actually specifically asked the judges to vote, although we haven't done a top 10 within the book, we specifically asked all of our judges to vote on their favourite autonomous concept for the year um, from a selection. And we thought it was important this year to start looking at autonomous concepts in car design review. It's not something we've done in this detail before. and because the judges work within the industry, I consider their opinion um, highly valid and much more expert than anything that I or a another journalist um, could consider to be important. And we've fed the results of those judging um, of judging of the autonomous cars back into uh, an extended trends report within the book this year. Um, and it's quite interesting. It's not necessarily what I would have considered to be the most important autonomous trends, but, but I think it gives a really nice snapshot of what the industry is interested in and what the industry is looking at. Max, um, I don't, we don't want you to give too much away um, because uh, we want people to purchase the book. Uh, so if I can ask you, Max, again, to uh, hit your camera. Yep. For the Car Design News Production Car of the Year Award, here are the cars from 10th place down to the winner. At 10 came the Chevrolet Corvette Stingray C8. At 9, Mustang Mach-E. In 8th place, the Byton M-Byte. At 7th, Aston Martin DBX. Sixth place went to Lotus Evaya. 
at five, VW's ID3. Fourth place, Polestar 2. Third place, Porsche Taycan. Second place went to Honda E. And the Car Design News Production Car of the Year Award winner is Land Rover Defender. Amazing. When we saw the Defender at Frankfurt last year, and it was surrounded by a scrum of photographers, bibliographers and journalists, we knew it was making waves. But the full scale of what the design team at Land Rover had achieved became more apparent as the show ended, and we got to look more closely at what they'd achieved with the design. Car launches don't make me nervous, but the Defender launch did, because the Defender is so loved and loaded with cultural meaning. Striking the balance between heritage and the future, Defender hit the mark perfectly, and our judges agreed. I'm delighted to now introduce Professor Jerry McGovern, OBE, Chief Creative Officer Land Rover, to accept the award for Production Design of the Year. Jerry, could you join us? Hello. Hello, congratulations. Thank you very much. It's uh, an absolute honour. Quite heavy, isn't it? Nice and solid, like that car. Thank you. It really is a testament. Um, it doesn't surprise me. And, and the Defender came out as a clear winner. Sometimes it's not so clear. Um, there isn't that much in the votes, but Defender really was streets ahead of any of the other cars. The judges held it in very high regard, as do we. Um, I wonder if we could um, perhaps go through a couple of questions. If anybody from the audience has got any questions, um, if you type them into the, the questions panel, I'll ask them to Jerry. But we could, if we could start off, as a car designer, how did you manage the challenge of blocking out such a well-loved original? I don't think it was really a case, case of blocking it. It, it. Our design philosophy is always recognise our past, but don't be harnessed by it. You know, we've we've got the Defender, we've also got a Range Rover, which is probably equally as sort of um, peerless, for want of a better description. Um, one thing I was very firm on was that we should not create something that had a retro, a retrospective view of the past. For me and the team, it was really about, and by the way, I accept this trophy on behalf of the team. As everybody listening knows, designing a car is a team effort, it's a multidiscipline task. Um, but our view was that if, if Defender had been replaced through a normal cycle, say every 10 years, which is, probably more than a normal cycle. What would that car be today? And, and so, you know, that was a big jump for us. And it was really about trying to capture the essence of what that car represented in the past, not so much in its design, but in, it, in its character. Because, you know, our, our philosophy generally is to design cars that are thoroughly modern and contemporary, and they're rel they have to be relevant for today. Um, and remember, this vehicle will sell to a lot of people 
who don't know anything about the previous defender. So it, it was about creating that balance. Clearly, we wanted the traditionalists to look at the car and say, you know, that's it, we love it. But you're not going to take everybody with you. Um, that's true. But actually, I think you did take quite a lot of the traditionalists with you, which which was one of the things that made me quite nervous in the build up to it. Um, by the way, I, by Sorry, the way, I was, by the way, you said you were quite nervous at Frankfurt when we revealed it. Um, you're probably more nervous than me because I was absolutely convinced that you know this vehicle was right, and I think it can bear any critical, you know, any learned critical uh, critique, for want of a better description, in terms of what this car represents, both in its design and its engineering. Yes. Moving on to the next question that I've got for you, how do you balance the form and function when designing such a vehicle as a Defender? Interestingly on Defender, they worked in harmony because th this vehicle had to be um, the toughest Defender we've ever created. It had to have supreme off-road all-terrain capability. So to, to have that all-terrain capability, it needs to have prerequisites like short front and rear overhangs, has to ha have a high sill for departure angle. So in a way, that helped the design because most designers will know when you've got really short overhangs, not on every design, but on a lot of designs, that can help the character. And it also forced us to do things that you wouldn't necessarily do on maybe more conventional SUVs, which was to introduce this sheer verticality at the rear, which of course helps maintain that all important off-road capability um, for that departure angle. So for us, the you know the design, the form, and the function were in, were in harmony with each other. Really, there, was, there wasn't there wasn't too much um, sort of fighting going on between the designers and engineers not that we have that anymore anyway we have an engineering team that are hell-bent on delivering our designs um another question um that we've we've had is how do you deal with the gap between ideal and reality listen what i think as designers we have to remember that we are we are commercial designers we're industrial designers and we're not designing for ourselves, we're designing for, for our customers ultimately, and also for a, for a business. So that it, it is always about balance. But having said that, we at Land Rover are very lucky in that we, are, we have a situation where design is accepted as an equal partner with all the other disciplines within the business, and it's well respected. And if you're gonna achieve great design, that doesn't just start with design. It has to be at the top of the business in terms of making sure that the architectures of platforms that, that are created by the business allows you to do, deliver great design because we all know great design starts with optimum volumes and proportions. And if, if you're working on an architecture that won't deliver those fundamentals, then it doesn't matter, no matter how good the surfaces and the detail and all those other things are, it will never be optimal. So we are fortunate in that respect. And I think, you know, that decision for businesses, do they want to become design leaders or do they want to create mainstream vehicles? Because they're two polarizing things. And in terms of your investment and the way you approach the development of your architectures, your whole strategy, is different depending on what that vision is. And, you know, I see lots, I can see, you know, I've, and, and, and it's not the fault of the designers, I can see lots of designs out there that have been compromised because of that fundamental issue of, of architectures not being conducive to, to deliver optimum proportions. And I, I feel for a lot of the designers out there, because they know who they are or what those companies are, um, we are very fortunate that with people like Mr. Tata, who's, you know, we're owned by Tata, totally understand 
what design is about and how it delivers the, the ability to create a company that is highly desirable and doesn't create just com just commodities. That was a long answer, wasn't it? Sorry about that. <laughs> Great answer. <laughs> um, which or what is the designer choice for your new Defender? It's right there on the on my right. No, hang on. <laughs> this side. <laughs> no, there is there. It's that one. I was getting confused about what's behind me. Um, for me, it's the it's the three door version um, in the Pangaea green because it's a modern interpretation of of the original greens that we had at Land Rover. Um, I love the fact that it's got a centre seat. I'm I'm planning if we can go there this summer or late summer to drive to the south of France in in a three door, and I'll be able to take my dog Teddy who's looking forward to sitting in that centre seat because he's always trying to get out the front screen anyway. Um, listen, I, I love both the three-door and the five-door equally. I think they're both optimum in terms of their proportions. They're incredibly durable. They do what they said on, on, the, on the tin. And really, they're a tribute to the, the great engineering, the great engineers and the designers that have worked really uh, strongly together to, to develop this and um, I, I did a video yesterday for um, for our customers in, in America who, uh, who are just starting to get their cars delivered and remember the Defender hasn't sold in in America for quite a few years now and you know I said to them that um, they're probably looking really looking forward to getting this vehicle as, mu as much as I am I'm absolutely convinced that when they spend time with it and live with it they will grow to love it and you know for me design has the ability to enrich people's lives and and that's what it's all about and you only do that by creating vehicles that are truly compelling and i'm not saying just land rover does that there's lots of other companies that do that too but vehicles that resonate on emotion on an emotional level with the consumers the ones that elevate themselves above the ordinary if you've got time, we've had a few more questions um, come in, one of them relating to um, your choice that you just made, actually, which is two-door cars are a rarity nowadays, I'm assuming the three-door version, but how do you come to the decision to make the two-door version design-wise? Um, the three-door version really sets up the image of, of of the vehicle and uh, we know there is a there's still a market out there for for three-door vehicles certainly more functional vehicles uh like this you know there'll be a lot of users that are don't need the extra seats in the back for example um plus the fact you've got the option of the center seat which harks back to the originals um and it was we felt that we know there is a business opportunity for the three-door there's a five door version as well. And by the way, this is just the start. You know, we, we're developing a whole family of, of defenders here, because if you think back to how it was originally created, it's a famous poster of all these defenders or series one and series two, three, et cetera, and shows the proliferations of different types of variants you could get depending on what they were being used for. That's great. And just one final question which actually I think is quite an important one. What are the challenges to keep alive an icon vehicle? So an iconic vehicle, what are the challenges for a design department in keeping that alive? I think the word iconic is interesting because I think today it is a word that is used too liberally. And um, you, know, you, you hear about the new iconic when something is launched, which is a contradiction in terms because without being a professor about it, you look at the Oxford English Dictionary, an icon is something that becomes one over time. You don't suddenly just get a medal and you become an icon, and you're certainly not one at launch. So this isn't an icon yet. Hopefully it will become one, but we'll have to wait and see. Um, but when you can honestly say the Defender did have, um, or the original Defender does have original, has iconic status, as does the Range Rover, which is now, you know, 50 years, um, was it today or yesterday? Um, 
so it, it takes a long time. Um, I think the important thing is when you're trying to maintain that sort of iconic status, if you like, is to recognize what the essence is, not just in the vehicle, but in the brand itself, and, and stay true to those, to that vision. Um, I make, when I talk about iconic, it, it links inextricably to, to um, equity in terms of it, its worth as, as a brand. That's why when it comes to luxury products, you can look at things that intrinsically they're the same in terms of their content, their costs, materials, and all those other things, but one is far higher in price point than another, and that is invariably because of its, its equity uh, as a brand, and it is all about protecting that. So it's as much about what you don't do as you do do, and it's, it's about thinking about how you evolve the brand to build that equity or maintain mm -hmm. it, versus being just influenced all the time by what's going on in the market in terms of quick sales, quick cycles, you know, just creating differentiation for the sake of it when you don't actually need it. It's a bit more complicated than that, but I think for me, that's the essence of it. That's really interesting. Thank you, Professor McGovern, for joining us today and for accepting the award on behalf of the Land Rover design team. We're absolutely delighted. Thank you for joining us. And um, let's hope we get to see it somewhere yeah. before the end of the year. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Thank you again. It's, uh, it's uh, an honour to, uh, to receive such a prestigious award from yourselves, being highly, de highly design literate, clearly, publication and those are the ones that mean more to me generally thank you thank you thank you okay so we've um we finished the production cars let's move on to the concept car of the year um abel's now going to show us the video of the contenders for the concept car of the year Abel, if you just take your mute off. Yeah, it's just loading up. The video is currently loading up as we speak. Um, these are quite big files, actually. But um, uh, if you just bear with me a second, we will load up the video right now. For the Car Design News Concept Car of the Year Award, here are the cars from 10th place down to the winner. In 10th place came Nissan's IMK. At 9, the Alfa Romeo Tonale. In 8th place, Lexus LF30 Electrified Concept. 7th place, the Cupra Tavascan. 6th place went to Bentley's EXP100 GT. At 5th was Genesis Mint. At 4, Citroen's Ami 1. Third place, Hyundai Concept 45. Second place went to Tesla's Cybertruck. And the Car Design News Concept Car of the Year Award winner is the Fiat Concept Centaventi.
excellent news. Um, I like to think that we tend to know what's uh, coming out at motor shows before they actually turn up on the stand. But the Concept Centre Venti was a big surprise uh, at Geneva last year. And I'm delighted that it's won the Concept Car of the Year 2019. The Centre Venti clearly has a lot of fresh thinking about the life cycle of future vehicles. And this seems particularly pertinent right now. The customization and the fresh approach to color and materials choices really stand out on this concept, as does the brand identity. It's unmistakably a Fiat. I would now like to welcome Klaus Busse, Head of Design, FCA Europe, to accept the award for Concept Car of the Year. Klaus. Hi, Max, how are you? Well, well. thank you very much. It's this is quite amazing. I also have this beautiful award you sent to us, and, and I can agree with Jerry, this is quite heavy. It's an amazing award. Thank you so much. It's very well um, deserved, very well deserved. Um, and I must congratulate you again on your secrecy uh, at managing to foil everybody at the Geneva show. Nobody knew that was happening, and then it just appeared. It was fantastic. Yeah, this is this is uh, not usual in our business anymore. No, um, the good thing is we knew we had our birthday celebration, the 120, and we didn't want to show up without a present. So this was our present to all the fans of Fiat, all the fans of Italian design, and a little bit also to ourselves. Yeah, it's it's a it's a really interesting concept. Um, I wonder if we could um, go to a few questions. What's the message behind the 120? Why was it created? So one clear thing was, of course, to celebrate the birthday. Cento Venti is Italian for 120, uh, so it's 120 years of, of fiat we wanted to celebrate and really wanted to show to ourselves and to the public what we think is, is uh, can visualize what, where we see fiat going, Some something that continues this journey of democratization of mobility, uh, something that is very affordable, but like you saw in the video, this ABC, affordable but cool. There's a lot of affordable cars, but what we wanted to bring home is really something that is cool at the same time. And uh, to do this, we had to look at costs more than style, to be honest. But that is also a nice way of Italian design, something optimistic that is designed to cost, uh, which was done in teamwork with, of course, with the engineers. So it was something where we could bring modularity, where we could bring something that's very affordable, especially uh, with the challenges that we have these days with the cost of electrified powertrains. Uh, this car is electric, so there's some uh, tremendously interesting, clever solution in there that were developed with our engineers, with our supply partners. So all in all, it's it's our answer to where we see, you know, um, the electrified, affordable future of, of vehicles. Um, could we talk a bit about the colors and materials um, and what was so unique and special about them? So um, to get to this target, you know, affordability, we had to really turn every stone because we had to find for uh, look for different solutions. Uh, one of my favorite solutions actually on the interior is when we look at the seats. Normally, you know, the, the way we construct seats, you have the metal pan, you have uh, the foam, you have the springs in there, you have the seat fabric on top. And we, we actually came across this beautiful material that you might know from even from, uh, you know, Crocs shoes, uh, something we, we found the same material, material. So we talked to the company, we said, you know, can we use the material also for seats? And um, so we were able to create these, these cushions that are molded out of the same materials that you know from these shoes. So the color is already in the material. It has a beautiful softness. Uh, so you, and it looks cool. You can mold in different patterns and, and you have the colors which are interchangeable. So you're you're summarizing three, four different materials into just one, which tremendously brings down cost and complexity. This is just one of many, many examples that we looked at. The car behind me, the concept car, was also uh, deliberately designed with just one exterior color to begin with, uh, something that would uh, be very reflective on UV light, something that would keep the uh, heat out of the cabin, so we could also invest in a smaller AC unit, etc. And then the cool thing is, you know, because the surfaces are kept so simple, we could then offer uh, infinitive um, abilities to wrap to customize the vehicle. So again, it started with the search for simplicity, for simple materials, and then actually it turned into something that is, uh, you know, had a really cool uh, result. It must have been so much fun to work on in the studio. Um, the secrecy almost making it more fun. Um, 
it's a completely different design to the Tonali, the Alfa Romeo Tonali that was shown at the same show, but also very Italian. What was the approach? Yeah, I think that was actually one of the beautiful things for us and for me personally, for our team uh, at Geneva last year, because we had uh, two concept cars, which of course is a rare feat, was a rare honor. And, and both, I think, are very Italian, yet so different. The Alfa Romeo exemplifying the Italian sculpture, um, the dedication to highlights, hand modeling, beautiful surfaces. And then with the Cento Venti, we went into the complete different way of what I still think is very much Italian, this optimistic product design, something that we see in a lot of Italian products um, historically, also today, very clever, very, very smartly done but always with that purpose to put a smile on your face, never with something that uh, appears cheap and unresolved, but something that is uh, thought through and that really combines functionality with an optimistic approach. I think it certainly achieved that. It put a smile on my face and continues to do so. Um, Chaz, what does this award mean to you? Well, um, first of all, this award is for the incredible team that is behind this car. Uh, again, you only allowed one person on this video call, so that's me. Um, but in reality, you know, as always, there's a tremendous and large team behind a vehicle like this. And although this is a concept car, which normally is very centro steel or design of its focus in any company, uh, this particular car was truly a vehicle that, that went beyond just designers. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, it would have not been possible without the engineers, without even the suppliers, because it has so many smart solutions. And it was very important for us that these solutions are not something that is, uh, doesn't stand the test and, and will be revealed as something that was only done for the show and really has no relevance. Uh, no, the reality is that all these solutions that we're showing really are meaningful and that is only um, possible if you have a creative engineering team, a creative supply team. But also, um, you know, the leadership of uh, the head of Fiat brand, Olivier Francois, he was the guy that, who I very early connected when I came into Europe and we were talking about what is the future of, of Fiat. And so this discussion about what this car could be, what the future could be, did not start six months before the auto show, uh, but it actually started years before. And it, and it kind of accumulated to this uh, you know, Venti vehicle. So really is a true team effort. And uh, for that team, this, this award will, will, will mean a lot as it respects uh, their work. And not only being one of many awards, maybe one, uh, just a reward, but I think, uh, the important thing is who it comes from. Uh, when you look at the list of uh, jurors, it uh, puts you know um, goosebumps on my arms because those are the who's and who uh, who's who in the industry of designers. And to get an award from uh, maybe the toughest jury that is out there means a lot to us here. So thank you very much to Car Design News, but also to my peers in the industry who awarded us with this award. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, and thank you to our judges. Um, thank you, Klaus. Thank you, and congratulations to all the team at Centro Stile. Um, and we will catch up with you soon, I hope. Um, I'm now going to move on to announce um, the video for the Lifetime Achievement Award winner. Um, this designer's name, and I think you know him, Klaus, um, has come up again and again in my conversations with designers about their formative creative years, and deservedly so. This year's winner is a humble colossus of automotive design and a worthy recipient of our Lifetime Achievement Award. Abel, please play the video. Homi Vakas might not be seen as high profile as some of the more showbiz late 20th century car designers. But in an automotive career that started in the 1960s at Mercedes and Ford, he went on to oversee the designs of seminal cars for Audi, VW and Bugatti from the start of the 1970s right through to the early 21st century. During that time, he also mentored numerous young designers that have gone on to have their own stellar careers as heads of design across various major global brands, including Jay Mays, Martin Smith and Thomas Ingenlath, and briefly became the VW Group's first ever head of design in 2002. His combination of great design, strong judgment and inspirational management is the reason he has been honoured with this year's Car Design News Lifetime Achievement Award.
Thank you, Max. Um, I think this was a wonderful um, tribute to Harmut. I got to meet him in um, Wolfsburg and spent some time with him. And he was an extremely charming person and is renowned and famed by a lot of people in, in Germany, but a lot of people in the design community. So what's next for um, Car Design News? Well, the next thing you can do is you can actually um, purchase the book. Um, and uh, we're taking um, orders as we speak. Um, I think it's safe to say, Max, we have no copies available for number six, number five, number four, number three, and number two. We have a few copies left of number one. So, you know, don't be shy to order your copies. Um, we have a delivery date for um, early July, mid-July, depending on where you are. Um, we are uh, excited um, to, for you to receive it. And Max, can you give us a quick flash of uh, a copy of it? Do you have a copy of it uh, nearby? I have a prototype. I have, a prototype. Oh, <laughs> I have one of the prototypes. Yeah, look, it's real. Um, and it's, it's nice to see it's that it's got one uh, of the colors. Yeah, Land Rover color. I guess Jerry liked that color. Um, but it was nice to hear the, of Jerry saying how, um, you know, um, how it was important that the team were involved and the vision they had. And, and Klaus also mentioning about the suppliers um, making things things productionable. So I think that's a very important part of our industry is it's not just the car makers that are involved in this, it's a no, num, numerous number of people. And the CDN Review 7 is a good example of how that is. Um, Max, do you want to finish and, with and I'd also like, Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd also like to make the point that it's not just me sitting in a room, although it does look like it's just me sitting in a room most of the time at the moment. It's not just me sitting in a room deciding um, the outcome of these books. There is a large editorial team at Car Design News, including all of our freelancers and experts and consultants who help us put together um, the shortlist, the long list, the trends. And without them, it wouldn't be as much of a reflection of the industry. So not only the judges who give their input, who are a critical part of it, but also the extended Car Design News editorial team who really make it all possible. and um, help me shape it into the collectible item that it has become. Yeah, and, and the good news is, Max, um, you're going to have to start working on Car Design Review 8. I hope that um, <laughs> excites you. <laughs> Hopefully not, not so much in lockdown. Um, the, yeah, la the last... Can I, can I wrap up, Max, with... Um, our next series of live streams are coming up on the 2nd of um, June. We've got um, some coming up with Autodesk, a webinar, um, and we've also got a live stream with the, the JLR team, the Land Rover team, uh, where we're going to be doing a super deep dive um, into um, um, their products. Uh, we're going to be showcasing something brand new and reviewing with Massimo some of the cool things they're doing in Land Rover. So, Keep an eye out on Car Design News, our, our series of live streams and webinars coming up. Um, and if you want to watch this one or if you missed anything, then um, it will be um, available um, through our YouTube channel. And if you have registered, you do, you'll be able to get an email with a direct link or if you to go to Car Design News. As I said before, we usually get about five to six thousand people watching it. So make sure you're one of those exclusive crowd. I want to thank all the people who are involved today. Um, and the um, FCA and the Land Rover team who have made themselves available and allowed us to come into their environments and see where they work and see the vehicles itself. Um, so it's, um, look forward to seeing you all soon. It's a goodbye from Abel and a goodbye from Max. Thanks, Alex, from me. <laughs> yeah. Thanks guys, and uh, we look forward to seeing you soon. Okay, bye. bye.